stand together as we read some scripture. I'm going to read Luke chapter 11. A couple of weeks ago, I asked Brother John Gadeen to read this as a Bible reading. And during the week, the Lord just reminded me of a verse here uh, dealing with prayer. And uh, so we'll read this and then we'll get into the, uh, the lesson, the message tonight. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased... One of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go to him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give to thee, or give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And let's pray. Father, we thank you for just the opportunity tonight to gather together in this setting and Lord, just to sit and rejoice and sing. And, you know, Lord, sometimes we're not perfect in our singing, but we endeavor to worship you if you're worthy to be worshipped. And we sing unto you. And, and Lord, I'm sure you enjoy, Lord, what takes place. And so now, Father, we come to you and ask that you would bless the preaching, the teaching of your word tonight. I pray that you'd fill each and every one of us with your spirit, that we may uh, understand in a better way uh, what you are saying in this passage. And as we look at other scriptures lining up with this, I pray that you would teach us. And maybe there's someone here tonight that's never heard this before, but would come to a realization of the truth uh, that we are endeavoring to share. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help me to communicate in such a way that people will be able to understand it. Lord, help me to be clear and precise And I pray and also ask God that you'd just fill me and use me for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to preface, uh, before I preach, I want to preface it this way. What I'm going to share with you tonight, uh, men of old have believed this and taught this. This Tonight is not a new doctrine, but it's a forgotten doctrine. All right, it's a forgotten doctrine. Uh, Men in the past, like um, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a very conservative, uh, well-known expository preacher, A.W. Tozer, uh, Charles Finney, uh, R.A. Torrey. Anyone ever heard of those guys before? All right. Baptist men like A.J. Gordon of the late, very late 1800s into the early 1900s. Men like John R. Rice. And even the late Dr. Jack Hiles all believed and preached what I'm going to share with you tonight. And I believe that it needs to be taught because I would hate to think that um, uh, we have something that we don't have. And and I'll, I'll clarify that in a minute. But when you read the Bible, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. And I'm not preaching or teaching this tonight just because I read it in a book. Uh, there's a great book that Dr. Hiles wrote called Meet the Holy Spirit. Uh, Dr. Rice wrote a book called uh, The Power of Pentecost, The Prayer Asking and Receiving. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a book called Preachers and Preaching. A.J. Gordon, he wrote a book called The Ministry of the Holy Spirit. And in all those books, seemed like R.A. Torrey wrote about the power of the Holy Spirit. And in all those books, they brought out a doctrine that is forgotten today or overlooked. And I want to say this, I believe... 
a reason why it's overlooked or forgotten is because of the, the Brethren movement. Now, I've got nothing bad to say about them. Thank God for every soul that's, that's won to Jesus. But when John Darby came on the scene, he was very dispensational in his teaching. And that, of course, flowed on from um, uh, John Calvin and those that came out of the Roman Catholic Church in a knee-jerk reaction to the false miracles and the false things that took place in the Roman Catholic Church. When those that came out of Roman Catholicism reformed their theology, of course, they broke away, they reformed it. And, of course, they, they set on a pattern away from Roman Catholicism. And unfortunately, what's happened is, is a lot of um, those men that began Bible colleges, Bible institutes, taught, the, taught those who were Baptists that didn't come out of the Reformation, taught their doctrines. And of course, we gravitated to that and we took hold of that. All right. So I want to preface by what I say tonight, saying that this is a doctrine that has been taught by many a conservative preacher and many a Baptist, conservative Baptist preacher in days gone by. And those men were never labelled as charismatic. All right, They were never labelled as charismatic, though they taught a doctrine that is very foreign if it was to be taught today. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to teach you tonight, I, I've taught in every church that I've been in. The last church that we were in, uh, lies were brought up, slander. Uh, all this sort of stuff was, was, was spread because of an inability to able to comprehend the truth of the word of God. And we understand that Satan tonight wants to attack the authenticity of the scriptures. All right. He wants to attack that. And uh, I, I, am, I am accountable before Jesus to share with you what I believe the Lord Jesus Christ gave me to teach you. Now, you are responsible to search the scriptures. You search the scriptures to see whether these things are so. You may come up and say to me afterwards, Pastor, I don't believe what you say and, and so on and so forth. And, and that's fine as long as you've got Bible to back it up. There's not an issue there. Most people that have come to me in opposition have never come to me with a scripture and showed me systematically through the Bible their position. All right. It's all hearsay. It's all this. It's all that. And it's like, well, show me from the Bible. and I'm happy to to believe it. So in the passage that we just read, our Lord had just finished praying and one of his disciples was so impressed, I guess, with the way that the Lord prayed and how he uh, interacted with the father in prayer. Intrigued, maybe, but he was definitely motivated to say to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. You know, prayer is the lifeline to God. Prayer is, it, prayer is how we receive from the Father the things that we need to receive. Prayer is how we get what we need from God. Prayer is how we get our power from God. Everything we do must be preceded by prayer. Or, or yeah, must be preceded by prayer. Having church is no good without first people praying before they come to church. Going out soul winning or door to door, handing out gospel tracts is of no importance without first prayer being given. It is even no good to get up and preach and teach the Bible unless first prayer has been prayed and God has been sought and his power and his blessing has been asked for. Before anything ever is done, it needs to be backed up by prayer. Prayer is the number one priority for the Christian and the number one priority for the Christian church. And so the disciple asked the Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. And so the Lord Jesus Christ gives them the model prayer, our Father which art in heaven. And it's a beautiful model prayer. It was the first prayer that I ever learnt when I got saved. But then what the Lord does, he brings it down to a, a, an earthly illustration. And he teaches us two things out of two earthly illustrations. Number one, he shares with us and said, uh, how many of you, if, they, if at midnight, would go to a friend and say to that friend, listen, a friend of mine has come to me. I've got nothing to give him. Lend me three loaves. And uh, the friend in the house uh, would say, go away. I'm in bed. My kids are in bed. And then Jesus teaches us a very important truth about prayer. And it's the truth of importunity or the truth of persistence. That man, that Jesus said, listen, the, the, the friend will not get up and give him, even though the one knocking is a friend, yet because he's persistent, he will get up and give him what he needs. So Jesus teaches us the importance of persisting in prayer. I think there's been too many unanswered prayers in our life because we just have not been persistent in coming before God and asking him the things that we need. 
So he gives us that truth about the friends coming and, and knocking and asking. And he says, if you ask, you receive. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, it will be opened unto you. He then brings it down even further to, to, to us. And he says, uh, he says to us, have, let's have a look at it again in verse number 10. For everyone that asks, no, verse number 11, sorry. He says, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father... All right, so now he's bringing it right down to grassroots here. He says, if one of your sons asks bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? And of course, the answer to that is this, no. All right, so therefore, if, if my son comes to me and says, Dad, I need some bread, am I going to give him bread or a stone? I'm going to give him what he asked for. If it's, within the, if it's within my power and ability, I will give what my children ask me exactly what they're asking for. So Jesus is saying, be specific in what you're asking. But he's also saying, you as fathers, if your children ask you, you will give them what they're asking. So if he asks a fish, is he going to give him a serpent? No, I'll ask, I'm going to give him a serpent. But then Jesus brings it down and he says, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So the lesson tonight is this, asking for the Holy Spirit. How many of you have asked specifically of the father to give you the Holy Spirit? By the way, this passage is not talking about salvation. When you got saved, you asked Jesus to save you. And when he saved you, yes, he sealed you with the Holy Spirit, but you were not filled with the Holy Spirit. There is a doctrine that is frowned upon, and that is, the do that is this doctrine that uh, there is a separate work or a subsequent work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Well, if you studied your Bible as we will tonight, we will see that not only did the Holy Spirit come in and seal at salvation, but there is a separate work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, and that is called his empowering work, his filling work, his, uh, his, uh, his endowment, his anointing, his, his baptism, if, uh, if you will. And I know that terminology is very frowned upon today when you mention the terminology, have you been baptized with the Holy Ghost? The first thing that most... Uh, conservative Christians and even Baptists think about, they think Pentecostalism straight away. Well, do you know a lot of old time preachers back years and years ago used to use biblical terminology and nothing was ever thought of it until the Pentecostal movement came on the scene. So we're going to talk about biblical terminology as well in regards to the Holy Spirit. But how many of us, as I said, have been specific in asking the Heavenly Father to give the Holy Spirit? We'll get into the verse in a minute. Let me share with you what Dr. Jack Hiles said about this passage of scripture. He said, I find it very interesting in the Bible that when it talks about the power of the Holy Spirit, it says that a friend came at midnight. I believe that those who pray for power while others sleep will know the power of God in their lives in a special way. And how true is that? While people sleep, there are others that are praying. Of course, if you're getting up at midnight, you're very serious about what you're asking God for. Just like this friend in this passage here, he had a need, he had no bread, he goes to his friend, he's knocking, 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 he's asking, 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 and because he was persistent, his friend got up and gave him exactly what he needed. By the way, he was very specific, he asked specifically for three loaves. We ought to be very specific when it comes to praying. And Jesus here encourages us to be very specific when it comes to asking our Heavenly Father who gives us good gifts and the Holy Spirit is a gift. He's known as a gift. The Holy Spirit is a promise and the Holy Spirit must be received. Dr. A.J. Gordon in his book, The Ministry of the Holy Spirit, said this, We shall see that we are required to appropriate the Spirit as sons in the same way that we appropriate Christ as sinners. So as sinners, we appropriated Christ, we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we're sinners, we needed salvation, and we came to him and we asked Jesus to save us. As sons and daughters in Christ, we are to come to the Heavenly Father also and appropriate the gift or the promise of the Holy Spirit where we ask the Father, Father, can you give me the Holy Spirit? And of course, it's within his power, it's within, within his ability to give us what he has. And he has the Holy Spirit. And if you ask him, is he going to give you anything other than the Holy Spirit? 
No, he's not, which is exactly the same teaching this is. If you ask him for the Holy Spirit, is he going to give you a bad spirit? No, no he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. So he's known as a gift, he's known as a promise, and he must be received. Now, there are many ways to describe the appropriation of the Holy Spirit. In uh, Luke chapter 4 and verse number 18, Jesus, when he was baptized in water, come up out of the water and the Holy Ghost came upon him. Do you remember that? As the Holy Ghost came upon him, he was then taken, uh, uh, filled with the Spirit, the Bible says, he was filled with the Spirit, went into the wilderness, and he was tempted by the devil. In Luke 4, 18, Jesus clarifies to us and says what happened to him. He says, the, uh, the, Spirit, of, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me. All right. So when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, he didn't need to be indwelt with the Spirit. He needed to be empowered of the Spirit because of his humanity. He's teaching us that we need the same anointing. We need the same power. And that comes when we, as God's people, ask the Father to give us the Holy Spirit. How many of us have been anointed? I'm not asking if you've been indwelt. I'm not asking if you've been saved. If you receive Christ as your Savior, you're saved. But how many have you been anointed of the Holy Ghost to do what God's called you to do? He's also known in Luke 24, and we'll see this in a minute, as endowment. He's known as a filling. And he's known as a baptism. The baptism with the Holy Ghost. And of course, when we talk about that, we are not talking about, I remember when I shared that, I said, oh, well, that terminology is only used once in the Bible. Yeah, well, so is endowment. So is endowment. But we're a lot happier with the term endowment or anointing, but we're not very happy about the term baptism with the Holy Ghost because of what's associated with it. I need a volunteer, and I'm going to ask Christopher, would you please come here? And I'm going to use you as an example. All right? Are you going to be baptized for No. I'm going to demonstrate to you what takes place. All right? I'm going to demonstrate to you what the term, the meaning of the term baptism with the Holy Ghost means. Now, let's just say Christopher has come and he said, I want to be baptized in water. All of us have seen someone being baptized in water, have we not? So when someone's baptized in water, we say, Christopher, have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, I have. It gives me great pleasure to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And what we do is we take that person... I won't drop you, all right, so right. Yeah. And we put him under the water, right? He, what are we doing? We are immersing him in the water. What is the water doing? The water is covering him, right? So when he comes up out of the water, he comes up wet, dripping wet. And we all know that Christopher's been baptized in water because the evidence is on him. Yeah. So when we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, the term baptism of the Holy Ghost simply means that we've been immersed in the Spirit or we've been covered with the Holy Ghost. And when we are covered with the Holy Ghost, just like the same way that we can see the water upon someone who's been baptized in water, a Christian who's been baptized, immersed, or covered with the Holy Spirit, you can see the evidence of, of that in a person's life. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's exactly what the terminology of being baptized with the Holy Ghost is all about. So it's nothing to fear and nothing to worry about. Now, I want you to go with me to the book of... Um, Second John, the book of Second John, and then we're going to go to the book of Hebrews. All right, Second John. In the book of Second John and verse number nine, I want you to look at this. The Bible says, Whosoever transgresseth, transgresseth and abideth not in the what? The doctrine of who? Hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So let me ask you this simple question. Whose doctrine should we abide in? Whose doctrine should we be learning and teaching? The doctrine of who? Christ. Right. Now I want you to go to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. All right. Hebrews chapter 6. Remember the doctrine of Jesus Christ is very important for us as individual Christians to adhere to. But it's very important that the New Testament church ought to preach and teach the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Well, let's have a look at some of the doctrines of Jesus Christ, shall we? Hebrews chapter 6. Look at verse number 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ... Let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation. Now, what we are going to read are foundational doctrines of Jesus Christ that I believe every New Testament church should be built upon. Look at the first foundational doctrine. Repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. I would say that's the doctrine of salvation, wouldn't you? 
So we repent from our dead works. Any, any person who tries to work their way to heaven is nothing but dead works that they must repent of and have faith in Jesus Christ. We're all okay with that. Amen. Well, have a look at the next doctrine. The doctrine of what? Baptism. baptism singular or plural? Plural. Ah. Oh, the doctrine of baptisms. Plural. Now, what's the next one? And of the laying on of hands. These are all the doctrines of Jesus Christ. And of the resurrection of the dead. And of eternal judgment. I don't think anyone has an issue with eternal judgment. We believe that's the doctrine of Jesus Christ. I think we're all okay with the resurrection of the dead. And I think we'd be okay with uh, the repentance from dead works and faith towards God. But we, are, we struggle with the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands. Now, the Southern Baptist Convention in America, a long, long time ago, before they dropped all of this, used to teach that part of their doctrine was the doctrine of the laying on of hands. Very important. In his book, Meet the Holy Spirit, Dr. Hiles writes a, a chapter on the transference of the Holy Spirit. That's very interesting. He talks about a, a great man of God. I think it was Bob Jones Sr. You remember, have you heard of Bob Jones Sr.? Senior? Yes. You heard? Yeah. Bob Jones Sr., very, a great man of God back in the day, he was dying and Dr. Hiles went to his bedside and he asked that aged old man, that man of God, he said, Dr. Bob, would you lay your hands on me and give me a double portion? So Dr. Bob laid his hands on Dr. Hiles and Dr. Bob prayed and asked that God would give him and fill him and use him and give him the power of the Holy Ghost. Is there anything wrong with that? No, no. no the course says not. I've had people in, in, in previous churches ask the same thing. No one sought gibberish. No one wanted to roll around on the floor. But when those things are sought by faith, I believe that God in his divine uh, ordinance and his divine will will give that which the believer seeks. And if he asks for the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe that God will do that. So we talk about the laying on of hands. How important is the laying on of hands? It's all through the Bible. But we struggle with the practice of it today because we have been tainted with wrong information. Or, let me just say this, maybe not wrong information, but a lack of balance when it comes to teaching the information. Let me put it that way. Now, the Bible says the doctrine of baptisms, plural. I believe there's three main baptisms. You say, well, Pastor, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 2 says that there is one baptism. And there is. And it's not water. The main baptism that everybody ought to have, according to Galatians chapter 3, when you get saved, you are baptized into Jesus Christ. Amen. You are placed in Christ. That is a baptism. You are immersed or you are covered. You are in him. You are safe. You are preserved. You are in Christ. Everyone's all right with that. The other baptisms are futile without that number one baptism. If you don't have that first baptism of salvation, being baptised into Jesus Christ, then the other two are of no importance. The second baptism is the baptism with water. That shows exactly what I've done by faith, by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as my Saviour. And I believe it's a prerequisite for church membership according to Acts chapter 2. Saved, baptised, added. Believe that. Then the third one is being baptised with the Holy Ghost, which is a baptism of power. It's where the Holy Ghost comes upon a believer and empowers that person to fulfil the Great Commission, the work of Jesus Christ, and even to live the Christian life. So baptism with the Holy Ghost and the baptism of water is of no importance unless you're first baptised into Jesus Christ, like Galatians chapter 3 says. But nobody teaches that. Nobody teaches that. Because we get hung up on the one bat, and it is, my goodness, I would rather have the first one where I got saved and go to heaven than just dwell on the last one, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, because a lot of people will preach that but never preach salvation in Jesus Christ. So we have to be balanced. Now, these are the doctrines of who? They're the doctrines of Christ. So why doesn't every New Testament church teach the doctrines of Christ? Because it's very confronting, isn't it? That's probably why we're a, a good church for recovering ex pentecostals <laughs> But you've got to teach a balance. Folks, you've got to teach a balance. By the way, I don't believe everything that a Pentecostal believes is, not, is, is unscriptural. There are some things that they believe which is very biblical. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. Help me out. Don't leave me hanging there. I know it's, uh, we, we might struggle with actually getting there. There are some things that they're way off. There's no doubt about that. But every, there's not everything they preach and teach is wrong, folks. So let's get into it, shall we? All right. Now, back in, we won't go back there, but in Luke chapter 11, verse number 13, I find it interesting that Jesus said, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Did you know that the Holy Spirit is known as a gift? He's the gift of God, the gift of the Spirit. I want you to go to 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy. <clears throat> In the life of Timothy, Timothy had his hands laid on twice. In 1 Timothy, we see that the presbytery laid hands on him. I believe that was his ordination. But in 2 Timothy, Paul goes back to when he first meets Timothy, and Paul lays his hands on him for a very important purpose. Look at verse number 6, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the what? The gift of who? The gift of God which is in thee, how? By the putting on of my hands. Now, verse number seven. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. That statement means that we ought to ask a question. Then what spirit did Timothy receive when Paul laid hands on him? He didn't get a spirit of fear. He got a spirit of power, love and of a sound mind. So here we see that it's a gift of God. And Paul lays hands on Timothy and says, Timothy, you better stir up the gift that is in thee, which was given thee with the laying on of my hands. For God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love and a sound mind. All right. So it's a gift. This is the first time where Paul mentions this in the life of Timothy. It's very important in Timothy's life. He then gets ordained into the ministry and he pastors one of the mega churches if you please of the day which was the church at Ephesus he needed that power he needed that love he needed that sound mind to do exactly what God had called him to do you cannot do for God unless you've been empowered by God to do that there have been times where Jeff and I and I'm sure you've even experienced it brother John probably when you've been out street preaching that you pray and ask the father to give us the Holy Spirit anoint us fill us however whatever terminology you want to use and when you go out there you're like you're like sheep among the wolves but isn't it interesting the boldness and the presence of God that comes upon a person because they step out by faith believing and knowing and you're at the door or you're on the street and, and there's just something that comes over you and you have this boldness and you, you ask the question and you preach the gospel because you know that at stake is, is heaven and hell, eternity, whether it's in heaven or hell and God gives you that ability to be able to preach that message. So it's a gift of God. Now I'd like you to go back to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Now, we're going to look at a few verses in the book of Acts, and I know that there are very, some very well-meaning men that would say, well, that you can't get doctrine out of the book of Acts because the book of Acts is transitional. Well, let me answer that this way. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So is Acts scripture. So therefore, it's profitable for doctrine. I'm just saying, all right? Acts chapter 8. Now look at this, verse number 12. But, now we know that Philip's gone down to Samaria to preach the gospel. Now look at this. But when they, this is the Samaritans, believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were what? So they had believer's baptism. Anyone got an issue with that? So you don't get baptized unless you first believe. When you believe, you get baptized. Is that right? Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now, what is he talking about there? Did they not receive the Holy Spirit when they believed? So why did these two men come down and pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost? Because he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He's talking about the endowment of power. He's talking about the anointing. He's talking about a filling 
that every person needs to have in their life. Now look at this, that when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, for as yet he, has, he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the only thing they had was water baptism, they were baptised in the name of Jesus. What's the other baptism then that they should have received? The baptism of the Holy Ghost. They had only been baptised in water, they needed to be immersed or covered with the Holy Spirit. Verse number 17. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now look at this. Now when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hand, hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the what? That the gift of God may be purchased with money. Is he talking about salvation? No, he's not. He's talking about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the endowment. He's talking about the anointing. He's talking about a filling. He's talking about a baptism. That is called the gift of God. It was the gift that Timothy had received. It was the gift that these people had received because they came down and they were prayed for that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And it was something that Jesus Christ himself said that we ought to ask the Father for. So he's a gift. Now, secondly, he is a promise. And I want you to go to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to begin there, Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, the parallel uh, uh, scripture for this is found in John chapter 20. And in John chapter 20, after Jesus had risen from the dead and in his glorified state, he walks in and he greets all the disciples. And by the way, there was 120 of them up in the upper room. He showed them the wounds and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. So when Jesus Christ breathed on them, they were indwelt or they were made alive through the Holy Spirit. Just like in Genesis chapter 2, when God the Father breathed into the nostrils of Adam and he became a living soul, Jesus breathed on his disciples and they received the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. They were quickened or made alive internally because spirits are dead until we're saved. Is that right? They're regenerated. They come alive. So then why did Jesus say then, you need to tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power? Because there's a subsequent or a separate work of the Holy Spirit that every believer needs to have. Remember, I preface this by saying there are some greater men of God in years gone by that believed exactly like this. They preached it, they taught it, they lived it, and they were never classed as charismatic or Pentecostal. But you preach it today amongst our Baptist friends and you are labelled a heretic because you preach this. Well, that would be just like Satan ripping God's people off with power. Because if we don't believe it, then we've got a powerless Christianity. All right. Now look at this. Luke chapter 24. Look at verse number 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you speak with tongues. Is that what it says? No. So even the Pentecostal is wrong when he says, have you received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues? That's not the evidence of the power of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is the power of God to be able to witness to people. John R. Rice wrote it in his book, The Power of Pentecost. He wrote it in his book, a Prayer, Asking and Receiving. So all these men that simply took the Bible at face value, believed it and preached it. So he says, you are to tarry in Jerusalem until you've been endued. And that word endued means to be covered with. Just like when we baptize in water, that person is immersed and totally covered by the water. All right. So this Jesus is telling us that though they've been indwelt with the Holy Spirit, they are now told to tarry in Jerusalem until they've been endued with power. Listen. No one ought to do anything unless they are first empowered by the Holy Spirit. Do you know Jesus never did any miracle until the Holy Ghost had first come upon him. His church never went out and did anything for Jesus Christ until that church was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Why do we deviate from biblical patterns? Do we, how foolish we would be to deviate from a biblical pattern and expect the same results. But if every child of God got a hold of this doctrine about asking the Father to give them the Holy Spirit and we were all empowered, I think that would make a great difference in our life. Amen. 
Absolutely. So here we see the promise of the Father. Now I want you to go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Luke, it's interesting, the Gospel of Luke, the first, I'd say the first six chapters really emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of people and in the life of Jesus Christ. Now Luke, uh, he carries this on because the book of Acts is all about the people of God now that have been empowered by the Spirit. Look at verse number four. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So this promise is also known as a baptism. All right. Do you see that? The baptism of the Holy Ghost is the promise of his power. Look at Acts 1 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. So he says to his disciples, you wait in Jerusalem, John truly baptized with water, but I'm going to send the promise of my Father with you. You'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost, and when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, he shall give you power to be my witnesses. Do we not need power to be a witness for Jesus Christ? We need it. Absolutely. Absolutely. How many of us have asked the Father to give us the Holy Spirit? Oh, but I got him at salvation. You did. You got, you got saved. You got sealed. But you weren't filled. Filling can come later. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Dr. Don Green, Dr. Don Green, who pastors in Michigan, right? His testimony is that he was pastoring for 20 odd years before he was first filled with the Holy Spirit. He was a Baptist, independent Baptist pastor. He had pastored for 20 odd years before he, was, he, before he was filled with the Spirit. And he said when he was filled with the Spirit, and he read a book by James McConkie, The Sevenfold, the Sevenfold Work of the Holy Spirit. When he read that, he realized that he hadn't been filled with the Spirit. He asked the Father to give him the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Spirit and he said his life, his ministry was transformed from that time on. You imagine ministering for 26 years without the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Incredible, incredible. But have a look at uh, have a look at uh, Acts chapter two now. Acts chapter two. So, on the day of Pentecost, they're preaching, and about three thousand people get saved. What a what a blessing that is! Look at verse number thirty-eight. Then Peter said unto them, because they had asked, uh, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said unto him, repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the what? Promise. promise. The promise is unto you, to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So he's not talking just to Jews here. He's talking to Jews. He's talking to the children of the Jews. But he's also got us mentioned there when it says, even as many as the Lord our God shall fall. So the promise of his spirit is for everybody that calls upon him. Yeah. Everybody that asks him, he will give them the promise of his spirit. Now go with me to the book of Galatians. Galatians. Just in case you might think, well, you're still in Acts and a bit hard to get doctrine from that. Well, that's okay. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse number 13. Galatians 3, 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. What a blessing. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. Look at verse 14. Now there's two actions in this verse beginning with the word that. So when he redeemed us, the reason he redeemed us was that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Let's stop there. What is the blessing of Abraham? Well, I'm glad the Bible answers that in the very same chapter. Look at verse number 6. Galatians 3, 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness... Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. 
So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. What is the blessing? The imputed righteousness. When do you get the imputed righteousness? When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you believe on Jesus Christ, you are given the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the first that. Then look at the second that. That we might receive the what? Verse 14. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So you receive the first blessing, which is the imputed righteousness of God when you get when you get saved. That the promise of the Spirit. Remember we went back. What is the promise of the Spirit? Jesus said, I'm going to send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in Jerusalem till you endued with power. Acts chapter 1 out. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Acts chapter 2. He says about the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the promise is for everybody. All right. So the Holy Spirit is known as a gift. The Holy Spirit is known as a promise. And Paul taught that to the church at Galatia. Now, receiving. You have to receive it. All right. You have to ask the Father by faith or you have to by faith pray and, and seek that very same thing. Exactly like some of the old timers used to do. All right. The problem is we don't want to get up at midnight. You know what I mean? We don't want to sacrifice time. Let me tell you this. I, I think we do an injustice when we think we can say a, a quick minute, two minute prayer and expect the blessing of God, meaning the promise of his spirit to come upon us and empower us. There are times where there's seasons of prayer where we go before him and we pray and we beseech and we earnestly need, we've got to get thirsty. Remember the Bible says that he will pour water upon him that is thirsty and he talks about the pouring out of his spirit, which by the way is spoken of in Acts chapter 2. So if you're not thirsty for it, you're not going to seek it, are you? Right, so you've got to be thirsty for it. I want you to go back to, uh, have, I want you to pick up two more places. I want you to go to Acts chapter 19 first. We'll go to Acts chapter 19 first. Because Acts chapter 19 deals with 12 disciples. Now, there's two ways that you can look at this. The first way you can look at this, you could say, well, these, these 12 weren't saved. That's why, they, why Paul asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost? They, they, they weren't saved. But I believe they were saved. All right. I believe they were saved and so did many others. All right. Because have a look at what Paul says here. And I want you to pick up Acts chapter 8 too because we're going to go back there and we'll see the same terminology. All right. So in Acts chapter 19, Paul says this. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, under what then were you baptized? And they said, under John's baptism. Then said Paul, uh, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized again, right? In the name of, of the Lord Jesus. So they were baptized in water a second time. This time in the name or in the authority of Jesus Christ. Not John's authority. Alright. Verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands on them. The Holy Ghost came on them. Alright. So and this says they spake with tongues and prophesied. Forget that. Everyone gets hung up with that. Alright. The Holy Ghost came. So when Paul said have you received the Holy Ghost. He's not talking to them about salvation. Because if we go back to Acts chapter 8, the same terminology is used in verse number 15. Who, <coughs> sorry. Who when they were come down, this is Peter and John, verse 15. Who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Well, they were already indwelt by the Holy Spirit because they had believers' baptism. They believed, they were baptised. Then these men of God came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So when Paul says to these 12 disciples, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He's actually saying, number one, have you been endued with power yet? Have you been anointed yet? Have you been filled yet? Have you been baptised yet? So he's asking the question, we've not even heard so much as whether there be any Holy Ghost. How many of you, when you first got saved, knew everything about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit? 
most of us would say, Holy Spirit, not even heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. So people have to be taught, but they have to be taught right. You've got to have a balance in this. There is, there is such a, an imbalance by everyone saying, well, you know, uh, you've got to speak in tongues. If you're not speaking in tongues, then you don't have the Holy Ghost. Well, that's not true. But then again, the other imbalance is you come over here, you don't even teach whether there be any baptism of the Holy Ghost or in Jubin of power or the, or, the, or the initial filling of the Holy Spirit. So then what happens is in the middle here, you've got believers all over the place languishing in a powerless life because they've not even heard about it. Or they've heard a wrong teaching on it. So Jesus said this, he said, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Have you ever asked the heavenly father to give you the Holy Spirit? I can guarantee you 95, I'll be kind, 95% of Christians have not asked the father to give them the Holy Spirit. Now it's interesting that you've got to come up with other ideas to counteract what is being said. So one of those ideas is, well, um, we don't need more of the Holy Spirit because we got it all at salvation. He needs more of us. Well, I don't believe that because the Bible doesn't teach that. We'd have to be pretty good for him to need more of us. Huh? We'd have to be pretty good for him to need more of us. Right, but what they're talking about is us. We've got to yield ourselves to him more and more and more. Now, let me just say this. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is known as the Spirit of Grace. All right? In James chapter 4, God says he giveth more grace to the humble. If we can get more grace, and he's known as the spirit of grace, do you think we could get more spirit? Yeah. I believe so. Just like, and I've used this illustration before, just like the glass. Does the glass need more water or does the water need more glass? I think, I think the glass needs more water. So in my life, I need more of the Holy Spirit that I can get. You know why? Because I'm a leaky vessel. I'm a leaky vessel. And, you know, I remember this, going back to the chapter in Dr. Hiles' book on the transference of the Holy Spirit, and Dr. Bob laying his hand on him and praying. There have been a couple of times in my life, the first one was with my pastor that, that trained me. I was looking at this, and we were both looking at it. And I came to him and I said, Pastor, I said, would you lay hands on me? And ask God to fill me and give me power. That's the first time. And that was, I don't know, way back. Probably 2000. Right? Now, the testimony is this. That when he laid his hands on me, nothing whiz-bang. I didn't roll out, oh, all this sort of stuff. But the people in church noticed there was a difference the next time I got up to preach. This time last year, when Brother Marsh was in hospital, do you remember when he was in hospital here for a month? I knelt by his bedside and I said to him, as an older preacher who believes in the power of God, I said, Brother Marsh, I said, will you lay your hands on me and pray and ask that God just fill me and empower me and give me the Holy Ghost? Why don't we do that? Because we're afraid. Because we've been taught, because of the, the extremism of the charismatic movement, we've gone to another extreme where we don't want to sound or act anything like that. God forbid should you use the term baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because you will be labelled something that you're not. But if it's a doctrine of Jesus Christ where there's the laying on of hands and the baptisms, then why don't we search it out? And when we find the truth, why don't we ask the Father to give us the Holy Spirit? Why don't we go to a man of God and say, Preacher, would you... I've had people come to me and say about spiritual gifts, which is something I might teach on at a later date. This person said, I really believe that I, you know, I would like the gift of uh, exhortation and things like, Pastor, would you pray for me? So I just simply laid my hands on this person. I said, Father... Such and such would like the gift of exhortation. We pray and ask that you give her that gift. We didn't wait for lightning and flashing and all this sort of stuff. Just simply prayed, got up and went our separate ways. 
But most people that I've had the, the pleasure of praying for all have said at a later date, something different happened to me. Something different in a good way. In a good way. Because God desires to give the Holy Ghost in fullness of power to all of his children. So that we can live this Christian life so we can be a witness. Now, people can label me what they want and they have done. Like I've said, they've said, oh, listen, if they, my experience is if people can't get you through the scriptures, they'll attack your personality, they'll attack your character. But there's been slander, there's been lies, there's been all sorts. You know why? Because most people, most preachers have a hard time when you take the Bible and you show them systematically through the Bible what the truth is and it goes against what they believe, they have a hard time accepting that. And so therefore what they have to do is they have to write letters, they have to send USBs around Australia and they have to say all manner of things and people then make a judgment and say, oh, this brother's a Pentecostal charismatic. <laughs> I tell you what I am first and foremost, I'm a Biblicist. Amen. I want to believe the Bible. Now, I'm not ashamed to be a Baptist and I know why I'm a Baptist. And there, have, like I've said before, there have been many other greater men of God, both conservative evangelicals and Baptist men that believed exactly what was taught tonight. And they've seen a difference in their ministries and in their lives. So I pray that you would seek it out, that you would look at it, that you would systematically go through the Bible yourself and find the truth in your life. Amen. All right, Father, we love you. Thank you for the truth of your word. And though it's very confronting, we do pray and ask that we would search the scriptures, for I am sure that the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth and give us the witness that we need when we hear the truth of your word. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.